and welcome to the Oddity Archive, the show that's uh, a bit of a glutton for punishment. But I at least know that I'm not alone. At least I'm semi-confident that there's at least somebody out there watching this and sharing in the pain. So with that in mind, I've been kicking around the notion of a second episode, proper episode, on the Philips CDI for quite some time now. And the thing that's held me back for so long is I've just had it in my head that it needs to be as bad and or as weird as the stuff from the first episode, uh, ideally even worse. But it's proven to be kind of a fruitless quest, admittedly. Uh, I'm pretty sure between other people's videos and my own volume one, that we've seen the weirdest that the CDI has to offer. Not that there won't be some weird stuff here, but uh, I don't think we're going to have anything that quite meets or definitely beats something like this. Yoo-hoo! Yoo-hoo! Mm -hmm. It's me! Mm -hmm. Bob! Bob! So while, yeah, we're not going to be hitting quite those heights of lunacy today, I, I think I can safely say that I've made up for that in sheer frustration on my part. So, uh, of course, the CDI is pretty well known for being a, a kind of limited piece of gear, and by turn, the software tended to be just a bit limited, and in some cases downright stunted. So, with that in mind, I've managed to cobble together three of the absolutely most maddeningly tight-assed titles that I could get my hands on, and two out of the three of them are games, so yeah, we'll, we'll do a little gamey stuff today, something we don't do a whole lot of around here. But, uh, yeah, with that in mind, let's just start digging in here. Uh, today's first title is actually kind of a very, very belated follow-up to a bit that I did on a, a pretty infamous VCR game, which appeared in one of the first VHS Vault episodes. We've added an exciting new dimension. Video. Clue VCR Mystery Game. A unique new game that brings you hours of murder mystery fun. Look for it wherever fine games are sold. Yep, you guessed it. It's the much-belated, not-so-anticipated return of Clue to the Archive, or a Cluedo outside of North America, same game. Now, uh, one last little note on the VCR game. There were two installments of that. Somebody saw fit to give the CDI two installments as well, and that's kind of where the similarities end. But to, to go off track just briefly here, I've had the first installment for far longer than I've had a working CDI, but it came as part of a greater lot, and I really wasn't all that interested in it, and I just never did play it. But uh, fairly recently, I decided to give it a spin, and if you were to look at the disc, there's a couple little marks on it, but nothing you would think would be a problem. But uh, this is the CDI we're talking about here, so uh, even just little marks, superficial marks on the disc means that chances are it's just going to lock up on you and you won't be able to go any further with it. So I figured, well, this cannot be a sought-after game. So I went on Fleabay, figuring I could get another one for a few bucks, and they didn't have one at any price. But getting back on track here... They did have the sequel, and just looking at it, even on the Fleabay listing, I could tell that this was kind of cold leftovers from the first one. So I picked it up, and yeah, my instincts were right on target. So with that, today's first title is Clue, The Mysteries Continue. Now, of course, the objective of Clue, though, is to figure out who killed the owner of Arlington Hall, and, of course, in what room and with what weapon. 
And uh, of course, it being Clue, the great running joke of it is that the owner of Arlington Hall and all of its occupants and visitors are truly horrible people. And uh, there is something kind of uniquely English about that, isn't there? But uh, as such, you would think this would translate well to an interactive title, a game, you know, for like a computer or something. But not really. But funnily enough, I'd say it's more on the tech end of things where it really fails. Uh, there's just too many load times, too much lag, and even by 1995 standards. And when you add that onto the already too slow pace of the game that they put in here, it's just, it's a death march each time. And uh, there is FMV stuff here, full motion video, but a lot of it just feels kind of redundant. And uh, I personally would have been happier just reading the dossier on each person like you do in the board game. But uh, yeah, no such luck here. But what really earned its keep here in Archive Land was I couldn't seem to get through the game. So I, uh, in the name of testing, played a few rounds just as the same character in the saddest way possible, you know, one person. And I kept getting, for the same case, different results. And I figured, well, maybe it's who I'm playing as or something. I don't know. Maybe I get different clues for each different player. So I played at least a round as all six players at some point. And I could never win, so to speak. So what I think is going on here is that the outcome of the case is randomly predetermined to the point where the clues don't change. So your sleuthing skills are just meaningless here. Nothing is ever supposed to change in Arlington. And some would say that it was Mr. Body's duty to protect the old ways. No one knows where he came across these people, but everyone knew soon enough that he was going to sell them the hall. And then old friendships and loyalties began to crack under the strain. Playing this game is simple. Arriving at the right solution is not so easy. Your task is to investigate the murder of Mr. Body. so tired. This must be such a shock for you. Your concern does you credit, my dear. Family characteristic, I'm sure. How am I to exist with these people coming onto my land and destroying my property? Why, even the tradespeople will refuse to call. Body knew I was in financial trouble even before I got into this hotel business. He agreed to sell me the five acres I needed to make the deal stand up. We signed a contract. Like a fool, I didn't press him for my copy until it was too late. Without that five-acre field, the hotel wouldn't be viable. He knew that when he sold the whole shooting match to these cranks. He opened the cabinet, and inside was a small safe. He took out what looked like some official document and began cackling away to himself like the witches in Macbeth. It did strike me that perhaps the old chap had done us all a favor and flipped his lid at last. Mr. Body promised me time and again that I would retire to the coach house. I know I should have had something in writing, but I trusted him. 
I've been here 20 years, and now I'm going to be put out by people that nobody wants here anyway. And I seriously thought about killing Mr. Body with his own knife. I was lucky that Professor Plum found me with it. Body's knife? I've been with him now for close on 20 years. And it's all going to end in nothing. Nothing. He didn't even have the decency to tell me about this. This gang of loose living anarchists he's fallen in with. Uncle Body let you invest in that hotel knowing it would be worthless without the land. He despises you. I only agreed to take on that hotel because Body contracted to sell me the five acres I needed for planning agreement. He's got that contract signed. I've seen it and I want it. It's in his study. If he's double-crossed you, that's your hard luck. You think the murder took place in the conservatory? But who was the murderer? Which weapon do you think they used? And this is your accusation? You think the murderer was Mr. Green, in the conservatory, with the lead pipe? Good work, but the wrong conclusion. You have the chance to try again, if you think you can crack it. A little more investigation could pay dividends. You think the murder took place in the conservatory? But who was the murderer? Which weapon do you think they used? And this is your accusation? You think the murderer was Mrs. White, in the conservatory, with the rope? I'm sorry, but you've got it wrong. You think the murder took place in the library? But who was the murderer? Which weapon do you think they used? And this is your accusation? You think the murderer was Colonel Mustard in the library with the lead pipe? I'm sorry, but you've got it wrong. When he got back to the library, Mr. Body was crouched by the fire, putting on more logs. He had no idea that the Colonel had come up behind him. The logs scattered as Mr. Body fell. The Colonel's army training now stood him in good stead. Calmly, he wiped the lead pipe on the antimacassar. He walked into the study and hid the pipe on the windowsill, where nobody would find it. Then he was ready to resume his evening's entertainment. The very first FMV game that I ever played, I was just six or seven years old at the time, was this little thing called Mad Dog McCree, which is best remembered as an arcade title and a Laserdisc-based one, no less. And of course, that's how I played it at the time. But it always stuck with me because it was actual people on screen as opposed to, at the time, it still would have been sprites, I guess. And uh, yeah, so years later, when I found out that there had been a bunch of home ports of it, and I had built up some of the gear to play it on, no less, I decided I'll try and find, you know, what I can for the systems that I've got. So I got two copies, one for the 3DO and one for, uh, thanks to a viewer donation, one for the Philips CDI. And, uh, I hated them both, and I especially hated the CDI version, in part because I had spent the collector's price for the Peacekeeper Revolver so I could play it properly, and uh, also because the CDI version is beyond unforgiving. So uh, normally with a, uh, it's a shooting gallery game, Old West Shooting Gallery. Now uh, you're shooting the bad guys, but there's no blood and guts. It's just bang, bang, and the actor awkwardly falls down. 
So anyway, uh, it's unforgiving in that usually with a first person shooter, if you will, you can see either the gun on screen or crosshairs or something. So you know what you're shooting for. You don't get anything like that with the CDI version. Or if you do, I never did find it. And I spent some decent time with it. So anyway, uh, I actually did a uh, Ben's junk on the Peacekeeper pretty early on and played a round of Mad Dog McCree there, but uh, I'll get back to that. I made a, a serious boo-boo in that video. Anyway, I, once I cooled off about Mad Dog McCree, I figured, well, I've spent all this money on this thing, this gun. There's got to be something else for the CDI out there and something better. Uh, there isn't much. But uh, the least worst option seemed to be this little thing from the same people that made Mad Dog McCree, no less, called Who Shot Johnny Rock, which first turned up in arcades in 1991 and, like Mad Dog, was Laserdisc based. Now, uh, unsurprisingly, this is just a film noir equivalent to uh, Mad Dog McCree. And uh, by the way, on the cover there, uh, that is not accurate. Uh, you are not playing as Johnny Rock's girlfriend taking out her revenge. Uh, you're playing as a hired detective, uh, kind of a, a Dashiell Hammett sort of thing. So anyway... Uh, once I got the game, I knew that I had to make some changes. And uh, actually, before I get into that, I should note that this does have a leg up on Mad Dog McCree and that you can actually have crosshairs on screen and know what you're shooting for. But anyway, uh, getting back to Mad Dog McCree here, when I did the video for The Peacekeeper, I ran it through my modern flat screen TV, which isn't inherently wrong. Uh, it's a separate sensor, so it doesn't matter if it's flat screen or CRT. But uh, there's a certain lag on newer TVs, and if you have any kind of custom settings going on, you truly have lag. I did not take any of that into account. So this time around, I took out my CRT PVM professional video monitor, so I have the absolute minimum lag possible, and I actually did fairly well until I hit a certain point, and I'll go deeper into that in the montage. But anyway, I, I walked away from this whole thing in making this episode, certainly, feeling like even if they had gotten all the bugs worked out of this, the design of these games was really meant to eat your quarters at an arcade and not be played at home. I never was very lucky until I met Johnny Rock. And now someone's even taken him away from me. I know it was one of the four diseases that let the hammer down on my man. Mumps is the name. What of it? Johnny Rock, he was a bum. Why don't you ask that grease monkey, uh, Cox? Johnny Rock, Johnny Rock, that's all I hear anymore. And he placed a few bets in my book, but I didn't shoot him. I pack a pencil, not a piece. Oh, sweet talk, Johnny Rock. Sure, he used to sing here. I was gonna make him a star. Why would I do him in? Do I look like I'm hurting? You know, me and Johnny had something in common. Dynamite. Him on stage and me with the dirty work. There's uh, someone to see you, boss. Then I made my first mistake. I said I'd listen. Telegram for you, boss. Johnny Rock. He was a singer. He always wanted to be on the hit parade. And that night, somebody made his wish come true. Johnny had the goods on somebody. I want you to find them. I asked if she was followed. She said she didn't think so. Besides, how do you turn down a dame that gives you roses? No! 
Say, bud, this is a private club. I told him I was looking for mumps. Yeah, well, I ain't looking for you. I'll store you in my cheeks till winter. <laughs> Take care of him, boys. told him that I wanted his clue to the combination. Okay, it's over there. It's over there. Hey, love. Get over to the pool hall and hustle up some extra cash. I fought my way inside the high explosives factory. I found the character I needed to talk to. I splashed acid on my face, so they call me measles. We're gonna bleach your bones. I run a clean operation, just a little dynamite! I told him, no more monkey business. Johnny's mansion. Now I had to get inside. We're gonna have to shorten your nickname, Slugger. To Slug. Let's give that heart a listen. No money? Get him out of here! You make a good stiff. A bad shot, but a good stiff. Admittedly, I wrongly noted on the original CDI episode that there was only one so-called interactive music release for the CDI. As it turns out, there were at least three. But in my own defense, the one that I covered, the Todd Rundgren one, uh, crappy as it was, it turns out that it was far and away the most interactive on a musical level that there was of the lot. So uh, today's final title does fall into the interactive album camp, but not in the same way as the Todd Rundgren one. Uh, in this case, we only get to deconstruct, if you will, one song, and not terribly far. So, uh, otherwise, what we're left with is kind of the ultimate geezer rock vanity project. Uh, and I kind of hate saying that. Uh, this comes to us from an artist that I go way, way, way back with. I mean, one of the first rock musicians that I could identify as a little kid was this guy. Peter Gabriel. 
And in the decades since then, I've rounded up a good chunk of his solo output, and I, I'm pretty sure I have all the stuff he did with Genesis at this point, uh, at least the stuff that got released at the time. So I'd like to think I understand him pretty well. And uh, indeed, going into this, I figured, okay, this is going to be the art rock aesthetic just dumped onto Windows 3.1 era software. And I was about half right. So anyway, before we go any farther here, today's final title is uh, fairly well known. Explora 1, Peter Gabriel's Secret World. And uh, poor Pete apparently had some skin issues back in the mid-90s. But anyway, uh, on a more serious note, uh, Peter obviously put some thought into this, and his crew put some care into this, so it's not, you know, sloppy or anything, but uh, it, it really doesn't work either. So anyway, uh, let's start breaking this sucker down here. So the basic concept here is not so much for you to deconstruct, in this case, Peter's then most recent solo album, solo album, uh, studio album, uh, Us, from 1992, uh, as it is to get into Peter's head, so to speak, and at first quite literally. But uh, what it really means is to get into the music on a more superficial level, like discussing it as opposed to playing with it or uh, getting into Peter's beliefs, or getting into his pet projects, and all that sort of stuff. And it's made all the more maddening because it's a scavenger hunt. So for you to unlock a good chunk of this disc, you have to go around collecting items, and there's a ton of red herrings, so you'll pick up a lot of stuff that winds up being totally useless. So anyway, uh, unfortunately, as is expected, I can only share parts of this. I mean, I've still got a six-minute montage for you here. But uh, yeah, we're up against the music, you know, on the copyright content ID front. But also, uh, you might have noticed on the bottom of the box, this got the big bad M rating, and uh, it, it's pretty well earned. Uh, there's definitely some adult content on this thing, and obviously I can't share that here. But uh, actually, uh, part of the reason why this is in such an oversized package, especially for the CDI, is there's a full-on paperback book in here, and there's plenty of adult stuff in there, too. Uh, but none of it's sexy, in my opinion. Uh, if anything, it feels like we're going into uh, middle-aged creeper territory here. I don't think that was the intent, but uh, yeah, I think Peter was trying to show how uh, liberated he was, so to speak, you know, a free spirited, free thinker, that sort of deal. And uh, the whole crew obviously knew that this was the first project of its kind, and it is very self-consciously groundbreaking. So getting back to the whole head thing, all too often the head goes right up Peter's ass. So anyway, and on a, an amusing note, in that book, there's this whole section where it's interviews, you know, written interviews with Peter Gabriel and Brian Eno and Laurie Anderson patting themselves on the back over how grand, uh, groundbreaking all this is. But uh, anyway, uh, one last quick point of business here before we get started. This was the third stab at releasing this thing. So this had already been out in 1993 on Windows, for Windows, uh, in 1994 for Macintosh and CDI in 95. And if you stack this up against any footage on YouTube of like the Windows version, you'll find out pretty quickly that they had to dumb this sucker down quite a bit for the CDI. Try clicking on a color bias down there. Hi there, welcome to the Explorer. In the case, you're going to find something that can get this journey started. Before you go any further, you've got to solve this puzzle. 
Can you find the right combination of features to make up my face? That's much better. Thanks for putting me back together. Before I go, I'm going to give you something to take on your travels with you. Welcome to my secret world. Some of the most powerful experiences I've had have been on the projects with Amnesty International, especially working with those people who survived torture and imprisonment. I think the, the tour we did for Amnesty to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Declaration of Human Rights took us to all these countries around the world, uh, in Africa, India, Central, South America. Um, and it was just the most sort of fantastic experience for me uh, as a person and as a musician. This footage for witness speaks for itself. For three years now, we've been working with many wonderful artists from all over the world and put out some great records. Check any one of them out by clicking on the album sleeves. There are many weird and wonderful instruments from all over the world. Why not try playing a few of these yourself? Have you found the love bomb? Sorry, you can't come this way. The CD-ROM team is trying to sleep, so I gotta keep it quiet. Bye. Hi, I'm Michael. There's a jam session going on in here, and Brian Eno will be your guide, so come on in. Hello, I'm Brian Eno. I'm a producer of records, which means I try to help people make their music or bring it to a conclusion of some kind or another. I'm in this system to help guide you through it, to tell you that certain things are possible and recommended, and certain other things are difficult or even impossible. Evans, this is the production room. I'm having some trouble with a mix of digging in the dirt. Come on in and give me a hand. We created this screen so you can try mixing a song yourself. You have four separate tracks of a special version of Digging in the Dirt. Play with the balance until you get something you like.
fucking sticky. This time you've gone too far. This time you've gone too far. This time you've gone too. Well, that's it for today's archive. Join me next time when I unveil the archive access system. So uh, starting with the next episode, you're gonna have to uh, find a few clues first before you can watch the episode. And you'll need to win a mini game or two or three or four, and uh, it'll help immensely if you have the archive light gun which I haven't really worked all the bugs out of yet, but uh, I will tell you this much, you're going to need a CRT monitor for that, so I uh, hope you have an old TV kicking around somewhere. Or you could just donate to the Archive's ongoing Patreon campaign and skip all that junk. <laughs> Sorry, you can't go in there without a pass. Try clicking it over there. That's off the computer. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>